good evening and thank you for joining us for our evening service here at Calvary. We're going to look this evening briefly before we get to our business meeting at Hebrews chapter 12. Very familiar verses and verses 1 and 2, the very first two verses. And just consider briefly uh, a passage of scripture that has been very meaningful to me over the course of my life and uh, and I believe it will set the table for something I'd like to do over the course of the next few months, periodically. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The author of Hebrews says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let us pray together. Lord, it is our privilege once more to come together as your people to worship together in spirit and in truth, whether it be through our giving through our confession of what we believe from your word, through singing or through looking to your word in this moment now. We just know it's a privilege, all that has been made possible through the work of Christ. So we thank you and praise you for that. And we thank you for the truths that are in this particular text. And I pray that you would use them to exhort our hearts and our minds this evening and that you would be glorified and exalted as we look to Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, in whose name we pray. Amen. I don't have this privilege yet, but some of you have probably had this privilege, or like me, will eventually have it. But were any of you in high school or at any point in your schooling career in any kind of like extracurricular sports of any kind? Okay, so quite a few of you, all right? How many of you who are, already have kids, maybe outside of the home, how many of those of your children participated in those same sports that you were a part of? Okay, good. So some of you know what that's like to experience both being in the moment of playing in that particular sport, as well as years later going and watching your kids participate in that exact same sport. For me, I grew up, and the first sport I got to play, uh, the first team I got to play on, was peewee baseball. And it was in a little town called Orr, Minnesota, population 248, one stoplight, one American, one post office, one IGA. I think the IGA is still there, actually. Um, but small town. But we had a high school there. It's where my dad graduated. It's where the first half of my childhood I lived up until about 11 or 12 years old. And about seven, eight years old, my dad really wanted my brothers and I to be a part of the baseball team that they had going on in the summer league. And because we were so young, we we're part of the peewee team. So he, he had us be a part of this, this team. And I just remember the, the very first practice, my dad was volunteering as one of the assistant coaches. And we're out there and they're just trying to figure out what position we were all supposed to be a part of and, and what, what we were best suited for. And uh, I was super excited. I mean, I love sports because my dad loves sports. And I looked up to my dad and whatever my dad did or liked, that was what I wanted to do or like. And so he's there and we're doing all this stuff. Well, at one point, we are in the, uh, in the process of trying to figure out outfield and who's going to be playing that. So what coach had us all do is he had us all get into different spots, whether it be left field, center field, right field. And I happened to be in center field at this point, very first practice. And uh, the coach is hitting pop flies, and he's calling out by our last names, you know, saying, all right, so-and-so, you're, this one's coming to you. And it just, I just remember thinking, watching him hit the, the ball, and with pinpoint accuracy, hit it right where we were. Well, he finally says, all right, King, I'm hitting one to you. And I'm like, all right, here we go. He hits the pop fly, and I, you know, whatever, eight years old, something like that, I, I'm trying to figure out where this is coming, and I had both hands up in the air. Now, mind you, I, I had this brand new glove that my mom and dad had got me for this uh, occasion. I was really excited, but I was still pretty much a rookie. I had no idea what I was doing, and I put both hands up in the air. And it's almost like in a cartoon. You, you, could, have, you could have seen it happening. Instead of the ball going in my glove, the ball actually went on this side, 
hit my thumb. And my dad, who was over kind of in the uh, infield, heard the snap when the ball hit my thumb. And uh, it, instant pain. I, I don't even know. I was just an absolute idiot. I don't know what I was doing with this hand up, too. I should have just had this one up. But in any case, the ball hit my thumb, and it immediately was swollen. I couldn't bend it. And uh, my dad's looking at it, and he's like, I, I think you just really sprained it, buddy. So I was like, okay. So we continue on with the practice. Then we were doing, like, batting. I just remember, like, trying to hold the bat, but my, I couldn't do anything with my thumbs. So it just didn't really work out so well. Well, for the next three days, my parents were operating on the assumption that my thumb had only been sprained, but it was still swollen. I wasn't able to bend it. I mean, we were doing all kinds of crazy things. Like my, my grandma and grandpa owned a dojo, and they were selling it, and so we had to pack up all their stuff and move it out. And so I remember with that thumb all swollen, helping move these boxes and everything. Well, finally, my mom's getting concerned because the thumb's not bending and it's, the swelling is not going down. And so they finally went, got an x-ray, and turns out it was broken from that one fly ball. And that was just the first practice. And I, the, the, honestly, that was the, the first thing that my, I asked. You can ask my mom this. The first thing I asked is, wait, so I mean I won't be able to play on the team this year? And it, sure enough, I wasn't able to play. I'd have a cast that went right here from my thumb all the way up. So experiencing that, I mean, imagine being a parent, my mom and dad, you know, first practice, your son's super excited, and all of a sudden he's bummed because he can't play the rest of the season. And of course, you know, I was just, that was just really, really disappointing. Well, I'm instantly thinking now, when Benjamin and Daniel get to the age where they're able to play some kind of sport, that I, I'm a little more cautious when it comes to sports. And one of the things is I'd love it if they were to play hockey, but uh, Laura's not as huge of a fan of that. And I can understand, considering I was just playing baseball and first practice, and I'm getting my thumb broken. You know what it's like to play in the game. And I guess I should continue on. The rest of the story is the next summer, I was able to play, and uh, I got to be pitcher and shortstop. And it was the most thrilling experience of my life, having all the people in the crowd just cheering for you. Uh, me and this other kid were basically the best pitchers on the team, and so the coach would sub us in and out for, for pitching, and if one was off was one game, he'd have the other one go in. And I just remember one time we were pitching in Cook, Minnesota. We were playing the, the Cook League, and we were just toasting him, absolutely toasting him. And this, this one kid gets up to bat, and I'm pitching this particular game, and so I hit the pitch. He hits it, pop fly, and it was coming just in front of the mound, and so I ran right up to the mound, got it, and my grandparents happened to be in the crowd that day, and they were just going wild. My dad was going crazy, and I just remember in the moment the euphoria of like, yes, like everyone's cheering for me. This is awesome. It was fantastic. I can't wait to have that with my boys. And those of you who have kids same age as me, you're going to look forward to that day probably too, where you can cheer for your kid, especially if they were playing the sport that you played, and you'll know what the experience was like when you're cheering for them as they're going through that sport. Similarly to what we're describing here is what's described by the author of Hebrews in Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. In this previous chapter, chapter 11, we sometimes refer to it as the hall of faith, because in it is listed person after person from the Old Testament scriptures who exhibited faith in God. Their faith in God and who he is and what he promised serves as the basis for the two verses we're looking at this evening. So what I want to share with you this evening are four ways in which we must run our race well, because that's what he's talking about. He's using this imagery of running a race in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, and we are running a race as Christians, and the question is, how are we going to endure it? How will we be able to run our race well? And here's the main point. I don't have this printed out for you. I apologize. But if you're taking notes, here's the main point for tonight. It's simply this. The only way you will run your race well is if you look in faith to the one who authored it, protects it, and ultimately finishes it. The only way you will run your race well is if you look in faith to the one who authored it, protects it, and ultimately finishes it. And there's four ways in which we can run our race well that will just kind of give us an overview of these first two verses as we look to the word this evening. The first is this. The first way for you to run your race well is to, first of all, know the history of the race. 
Know the history of the race. I, you know, those of you who know sports and, and love particular sports, you probably know so many things about that sport. Um, you know the, the way, like for example, with baseball, you probably know the way bats are made or, or you know the significance of the way a, a baseball is put together. You know the significance of the, the glove that you use and which hand it's supposed to be on. You know all the ins and outs about your sport. You probably even know some of the history of famous people who have played your sport. If I were to say Babe Ruth, most of us would know that that name is associated not just with a candy bar, but with the sport of baseball. Or if you know Wayne Gretzky, you know what sport that happens to be. You have to know the history of your race. By the way, if you don't know who Wayne Gretzky is, that's hockey. (laughs) I I guess I should figure that out. Know the history of your race. And the reason why I say this is because the author of Hebrews starts chapter 12 with this word, therefore. If he says therefore, you have to go back and see what he has just said. And clearly we don't have time to go through all 40 verses of chapter 11, but I do want to draw your attention to just a couple momentarily. Back in chapter 11, I'm going to back up to, uh, to verse 13 first of all where he's talking about people like Abel and Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Jacob, Sarah, all of these people who exhibited faith. And he summarizes this in verse 13 by saying, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Here these people are described as pilgrims, travelers. They don't belong here. In a sense, they're aliens. aliens. They're foreigners. They're not from around here. And they traveled in faith. They, they, They traveled and lived on this earth with the eyes of faith. And these people desired, in verse 16, as he says, a heavenly country, a heavenly homeland. So he goes through then and lists people, the patriarchs, such as Abraham, in verse 17, 18, and 19. Isaac, in verse 20. Jacob, verse 21. Joseph, verse 22. Moses, verse 23. And he talks about, in verse 30, the, by faith the walls of Jericho went down. Verse 31, harlot Rahab didn't perish because she lived by faith. And he says, in verse 32, finally, what more shall I say? If this isn't enough for you, the time would fail me to tell you of Gideon and Barak, Samson, Jephthah, the, uh, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weaknesses were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead race to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourging, yes, of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. They were tempted, were slain by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy." These people ran a difficult race. I would say most of us in this room could not identify with half, three quarters, 90% of the things the author of Hebrews just listed right there. We have endured things in this life. We've endured suffering. We've endured hardships. I'm not saying we haven't, but I'm saying how many of us have endured those kinds of things? How many of you have been tortured for your faith? How many of you have been sawn asunder for your faith? How many of you had trial of mockings and scourgings, have been in chains and imprisonment, stoned, sawn in two, slain with the sword? These are the kinds of things that these saints of old endured. And they endured it with faith. And he says, summarizing it all in verse 38, the world was not worthy of these people. Why? 
It's not as though they were somehow good people, righteous people in and of themselves, and the rest of the world wasn't. But it was because they lived by faith. And the author of Hebrews already has defined what that is in chapter 11, verse 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. These people lived by faith in God and his promises. So, therefore, he says in chapter 12, verse 1, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, you have so many people who have run the race before you. And what's really interesting here in chapter 12, verse 1, is that that word witnesses here It's not just like spectators. So some of us have spectated sports we've never played, right? You go and you watch, and you can appreciate the skill of the players. You can appreciate appreciate the skill and the, the intellect of the coaching staff and everyone who's working together to make the team succeed in the game or the sport. But you haven't experienced it because you yourself have not played that sport. So you become a spectator, but you don't understand in an experiential way what they're doing. That's not the case with these witnesses. In the race that God has given to every Christian, in the grandstands watching us run our race, are the people who themselves ran the race. And we're surrounded by them. It's like we're in this coliseum and you've got the track running around and you're running your race as fast as you can and you hear the crowds cheering you on, except they're not the people doing the cheers because they just want to be entertained. They're the people who know exactly what it's like to experience the race you're experiencing yourself. This race that we run is not run alone. It's not run in a vacuum There is a history behind the race, and chapter 11 is one of the most precious chapters to me because it talks about people who struggled with the same things I struggle with, who went through the same testing of their faith like I've gone through, like you've gone through, but whose faith was tried and who ran their race by the grace of God, and they ran their race in a specific way. And I think that's what the rest of this is here in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, when he says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, so number one, know the history of the race. Know that there are other people who have run the race and succeeded. But number two, actively prepare for the race. You need to know the history, but now you need to prepare to run your race. And what does he say you should do? Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. If you're running a race, you're not going to be running a race with the heaviest clothes on possible. You're going to run your race with the lightest weight clothes, the same kind of clothes you want to wear when you step on the scale, the stuff that's not going to be heavy. You want to, you want to be running a race with as least amount of resistance as possible. So lay aside the weight Lay aside the things that will hinder you from succeeding in running as fast as you possibly can in the race. But then he says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. Now it's almost like he goes from a metaphor to something very specific. The sin which so easily ensnares us. And the question we have to ask is, what is that sin? What is he talking about? And a lot of times we can apply it to a specific sin struggle that we have. And the reality is, is we all have specific things that Satan knows is our struggle. After thousands of years, Satan has become a master at finding out exactly what sin will tempt and cause to stumble each and every one of us in this room. So what I may struggle with is not what you may struggle with. And what you may struggle with is what I might not struggle with. But we all will struggle with something. And so sometimes people will look at this and say, the sin which so easily ensnares us is that sin which we just, we naturally struggle with, and it's kind of individually based. What you struggle with, that's what it is for you. What somebody else struggles with, that's what it is for them. And that could be what the author of Hebrews is saying. The other thing he could be saying is just in general, the sin struggle. I mean, we're all operating under a curse. God has placed his curse upon this creation because of our rebellion, And justly so. 
And so every time we go through life as Christians, it's like there's this war inside of us because on the one hand, you have Christ within you, you have God's Holy Spirit within you, and you have this longing to emulate the Savior. You have this longing to live and represent rightly your King, the King of kings and Lord of lords. But like Paul talks about in the book of Romans, there's this, there's this intellect that you have where you know what the right thing is. And yet, what you know you should do, you don't do. And what you know you shouldn't do, you end up doing. And you just find this war inside of yourself fighting. It's the sin that so easily ensnares us. Just this week, you could look back, I'm sure, at ways in which you sinned, whether it be particularly just between you and the Lord, whether it be a way in you sinned against somebody in your family, sinned at your workplace, sinned with somebody with your friends. And and you can think about that and you think, I know I shouldn't do that. I know I shouldn't respond this way. I know I shouldn't think this way, but it's just a struggle. Perhaps that's what the author of Hebrews is saying as well. But I think there could be one other explanation or one other interpretation for what he's saying. If you consider all of Hebrews 11 in conjunction with chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, the emphasis on chapter 11 is that of the faith of each of these individuals who exhibited faith, faithful obedience to God, trusting in his promises, faithfully living out their trust in a world that's fallen and and hard. And the sin which so easily ensnares us could be that lack of faith, that lack of trust that we have day in and day out. And if you go, I mean, if you step back and think about it, every time you sin, that is a lack of faith. So it's still, there, there isn't necessarily one right or wrong answer, but I just wonder if the author of Hebrews is saying, look, you are supposed to be living by faith, even as all of these other witnesses have. And you know what the hard thing is? Even though I can give you person after person after person who has lived by faith, every one of them struggled, just like you. And you're going to look at those people, it could be easy to see them, and be like, they never struggled. And yet here I am trying to struggle through my faith and my walk with God. And the author of Hebrews is saying, you're not alone. All of these other people experience the same thing as you. The sin which easily ensnares us is the fact that sometimes we hear what God says, but we don't believe him. Or we don't live it out. So the sin that so easily ensnares us is what we must lay aside Lay it aside. And how do you do that? It's almost like circular reasoning here, but you have to, by faith, cling to someone. That's the only way. So know the history of the race. There are a great cloud of witnesses who are cheering us in the grandstands, who have experienced the race. Then we must actively prepare for the race, lay aside the weight and the sin which easily ensnares us. And then he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Let's do it. Run your race. Number three, we should know the history of the race. We should actively prepare for the race. And then we should possess a singular focus in the race. Possess a singular focus in the race. He says here in verse two, the first three words, looking unto Jesus. He does not say, Looking unto Abraham, looking unto Jacob, looking unto Joseph. He says, looking unto Jesus. Our eyes as Christians must be with the eyes of faith to the one who ran the race perfectly. The one whose righteousness we cling to because we possess none of our own. And Jesus is the one who ultimately was the singular focus of each of the people in chapter 11. They looked with the eyes of faith. Did they know Jesus, the God-man, specifically? No, because chronologically speaking, he came years after them. But with the eyes of faith, were they looking forward to the promised Messiah who would come? (laughs) Yes, they were. And they looked with faith to that. Now here we are, 2,000 years later, after Jesus has come, looking back, seeing the Messiah, seeing the people who before he came looked with the eyes of faith to the time when he would come. 
And now we say, all right, we're going to keep our eyes on him as we continue onward. Looking unto Jesus, possess a singular focus, focusing on Christ. If your life is consumed with anything else besides Christ, you're not looking to him. That's not to say we can't have other interests in life. That's not to say you can't have hobbies. It's none of that. But if your singular focus in the race is not Jesus, you cannot hope to win your race. Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. You may have a new translation in front of you, and it might say he is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. Jesus is the one who lived out the righteous life we're supposed to live and can't. Jesus is the one who will bring us to the completion of our faith, the glorification one day when we stand before him, and he makes us whole and clean. Jesus is our singular focus because he is the one who pioneered our faith. He is the one who will perfect our faith. And finally, number four, in order for you to run your race well, you must know the history of the race. You must actively prepare for the race. You must possess a singular focus in the race. And finally, you must follow the example for the race. And this is similar to point three, but here's what he says about Jesus. He continues on. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. If you stop to think about that phrase, that is the most paradoxical phrase you can, you can think of. Who for the joy set before him endured the cross. Now imagine this is in the culture where the cross is not something that they did thousands of years ago and now we're in a refined culture where we don't do that kind of stuff anymore. For whoever wrote Hebrews... And whoever read Hebrews when it was written, the cross was a very real and still living thing that they experienced. There were people who were still being crucified. There were people that they knew so-and-so's brother got crucified. So-and-so's cousin got crucified. They knew this was a very real thing. So if somebody says, who for the joy set before them endured the cross, this is such a paradoxical statement. How can you possibly have joy thinking about such a horrendous, cruel, violent death, clouded with humiliation. What is joyous about that? And the reality, I believe, that the author of Hebrews is getting to is he's talking about the, particularly the end of the faith, the joy that was set before him. What was set before Jesus after the cross? This is what Paul says, and I love, this is one of my favorite passages from Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, when he's talking about Jesus Christ, who made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, coming in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, he became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. But verse 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The joy set before him was this wonderful, joyous exaltation that the Father would give the Son. And then, as a love gift to the Son, the Father would give to him his bride, as we read in Revelation 19, there's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb in which the bride will make herself ready and the bridegroom will enjoy that meal with his bride. We are this love gift that the Father has given to the Son. What a joy that he could endure the cross then as he looked forward to the day when he would sit and have a meal with you. So the joy that was set before him Certainly, uh, he was very anxious and agonizing over the, the experience and death of the cross. You see that in Gethsemane when he's wrestling in prayer with the Father, saying, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And then he goes and fulfills exactly what the Father has sent him to do. And after he is resurrected, he is vindicated the joy that is set before him is that he is at the right hand of the Father looking forward to the day when he will be with his bride. The example of somebody 
who endured suffering in the present to look forward to the joy and hope of the future is exactly what we have to endure. Because look, every single one of us in this room has gone through suffering of some sort, some of us more than others. Some of you have experienced health challenges. Some of you have experienced personal family challenges. You've endured suffering. But if all you do is focus on the here and now suffering, you're missing the point. The joy that is set before you is the fellowship meal that you get with your Savior, basking in the presence of Jesus Christ. If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what else could possibly excite you. So Jesus, he's our example of one who in the present endures suffering, looking forward to the day when there was a joy that was set before him that he would get to experience. And then it says he despised the shame. I mean, one of the, one of the aspects of the cross that we don't often bring out is the shameful aspect. Any depiction you see of Jesus on the cross, what is always on him? A loincloth. But frequently, it's attested in history that people who were crucified on the cross were crucified completely naked. An absolutely shameful thing. Not just hanging in agony from beatings, enduring the, mocker, the mocking and scorn of crowds, but hanging there fully exposed in your nakedness and in shame and humiliation. Jesus endured the suffering, despised the shame. And here is where he is now. He has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the one who is the author of your faith, the pioneer of your faith, and he is the one who will perfect your faith. The reason why I wanted to proclaim this particular passage to you is because over the course of the next several months, periodically, in an evening service, I want to do a Christian biography series. And here's why. Because, first of all, <laughs> I'll be completely candid with you. As a young man in the Christian faith, there is sometimes questions that swirl around in your mind and questions that you have to wrestle through and, and work through. And one of the things that the Lord has used in my life to bolster my faith is looking at the example of the faith of others. Many of those are even people in this room. But there are others that we don't know about, or at least maybe we don't know about, but frankly, I think we should. And so I want to periodically on a Sunday evening share with you a saint from church history, the life of somebody who is essentially what's described in chapter 12, verse 1. One of the great cloud of witnesses for us since the cross. Somebody who endured suffering, somebody who walked through the challenges of life and philosophies of their day, whose faith was assailed and attacked by Satan and the world and their own flesh, but who still continued to press on with the eyes of faith and who serve as examples of what it's like to persevere in faith. And this text, I think, is an exhortation to us to look to those people who have gone before us, who lived and ran their race faithfully, not perfectly, but faithfully, who continued to set their eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of their faith, and who are now standing in the grandstands of the race, watching you and cheering you on in your race. I think that if you knew how many other people in church history endured so many things that many of us have endured, many, many things that we've never endured or, or might never endure, and you see how they responded in faith to those things, I think you will find that it will greatly bolster your own faith and encourage yours. It certainly does for me, and I hope that it will for you. One older lady in our congregation back in Hibbing, Minnesota, um, Mrs. Dorothy Van Skindel passed away um, about a month or so ago, and her funeral was live-streamed. She is technically my step-grandmother because her grandson is married to my mom, so my, my stepdad's grandma. But she, I remember in church, she was always there, and in fact, I was actually watching a video that was recorded of me and um, uh, Catherine singing a duet at my church at Camp Swampy last year. 
And in the video, you can see this lady, Mrs. Dorothy Van Skyndel, sitting there in the spot she always sat in. They always had to give her this special hear hearing set because she, she was very hard of hearing, but they would, could pipe the sound through the sound system so that she could hear it. And in that video, she's just sitting there listening to the music. Now, about a month, month and a half ago, she has passed away. She has finished her race, and she is now in the grandstands cheering on the next generation of Christians who are running their race. At her funeral, though, which was live-streamed, uh, some friends of mine were at the funeral, and they sang a song. And the song is called I Am Listening. I'd never heard it before, but it's by a group called Forever Be Sure. Um, I know of that lady who leads that group. And the song is a testimony to the faithfulness of others. And the song is called I Am Listening because it's from the perspective of somebody who's looking at somebody else who's run their race or somebody else who's an older saint who has run a majority of their race and is in the twilight years of their life. And I should have printed off the lyrics um, because I know when I'm on the spot and trying to remember lyrics, I'm never going to remember them. But the chorus goes something like this. I can hear you, I am listening, and I marvel at faith so strong. Keep on praising, singing, and speaking of the faithfulness of God, for it helps me to carry on. I heard that song, I never heard it before, and yet it was just a wonderful testimony to me of this very passage that we read in Hebrews 12. Looking to the people who have lived and run their race as well and say, I am listening and I'm watching your faith and your faith is what God is using to bolster my own. And I hope that as we look to this, this series that I'll periodically do, it won't be consistent, it'll be here and there, but as we look to these godly men and women of church history, I hope that you too will be encouraged in your faith and race. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for Jesus Christ who is the author and finisher of our faith who in spite of the suffering he endured looked with joy to the day when the love gift of the Father he would enjoy and that love gift is us your people, the church thank you Lord that you have given to us this precious, precious promise that one day where he is, there we may be also. As we run our race now, Lord, with the eyes of faith, and as the one whom we have not seen we love continues to be in our focus and in our gaze, I pray for any person in this room whose faith may be weak in this moment, that you would help them to see the faith of others, the faithfulness of others, and that their eyes would turn to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, that you've given to us men and women, whether they be our parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, other family members, dear friends, who have been examples of living faith, vital living faith, who confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in this earth, and who looked for their heavenly homeland. Help us, Lord, by the working of your Spirit, to do the same. For we ask it in our Savior's name, Jesus. Amen.